anything else you've noticed that we haven't discussed about this case and how it's progressing that's important for observers to, to realize or the public to note? Um, well, I think the, the, the underlying legal, uh, uh, the underlying crime that makes it a felony that we were talking about earlier, you know, the main focus has been on this campaign conspiracy. I'm interested to see how that state kind of fleshes that out because they haven't been a hundred percent clear, at least I don't think on whether they're primarily talking about a federal campaign violation or a state conspiracy campaign violation. They've even mentioned at different times a tax violation, you know, a tax law violation. Maybe that's the underlying law that they were trying to conceal. Um, you know, and they're going to need to pick one at some point or, or, you know, argue, maybe they'll argue all three, but um, they uh, seem to be a little less than clear so far on which one it's going to be, what their primary focus is, what's their, what their legal theory is. And that could affect how the judge ends up instructing the jury, how the case ultimately goes. So I'm kind of curious to see how that all plays out. The basic facts are not super complicated. You know, the, the falsifying of documents in the story, you know, things like that. But some of the underlying legal theories are a little more, a little more complicated in terms of how you make this a felony and why. Yeah, and as you mentioned, jury instructions are crucial, as we just saw in the Weinstein case, where um, yeah. you, know, you have to make sure that the jury instructions are clear, and and of course, which which theory of prosecution you're going forward with. And do you feel like this may have been, you know, Alvin Bragg delayed bringing this case? A number of pros there were prosecutors who resigned from his office because initially he declined to move forward with prosecuting Trump. Do you believe that? Potentially, there' a little bit of a not like not a lack of direction, but lack of specificity isn't just necessarily a trial tactic, but could do with the fact that they were a little bit unsure about how to proceed in the strongest possible way with a, a case. I don't know if it's that. I think I mean they're not required to specify more in the indictment, you know, they're allowed to keep these options open. And so that gives them kind of maximum flexibility. And, and I think if you've got that option, you take it, right? You, because then you, it allows you to see how the trial plays out and how the evidence is coming in and, and you can kind of adopt your presentation accordingly. So, you know, if they didn't have to pin themselves down hundred percent earlier on, then I think it makes sense that they didn't. I kind of leave, leave that flexibility uh, for them to possibly, you know, take advantage of as the trial goes on. So we're just gonna have to see how it, it's, well, how it ends up is what's most important, right? What, how do they end up arguing to the case of the jury in closing and how the jury get instructed? Um, and that's gonna depend on how the, how the uh, evidence comes in. So that's very interesting. Yeah, so they, they're able to um, hold their, play their cards close to the vest up until uh, the very end. And that's um, part of the, um, part of their strategy clearly. And the element of surprise is always a positive to have. I really appreciate you joining me and giving your analysis of the trial, what's been happening um, today, day seven of the trial, and of course, um, the cumulative um, case that's that's going forward. So thank you for joining me and I really appreciate your time.